All right, guys, looks like there's blood on the streets. Palantir earnings came out and the stock is getting absolutely smashed. From what I can tell, it's pretty much just a whole EPS miss. Now, we're going to quickly go over the really just the highlights of the stuff. So your total revenue grew 34% year over year. They were at 36% in Q3 and then 49% in the previous two quarters. So there's a sign of a slowdown there. Not great, but it is what it is. It's respectable. Uh, commercial revenue grew 47% year over year. I think people were expecting it to be higher, but it wasn't. Uh, government revenue grew 26% year over year. Now the other two points are actually whatever, like you can have your opinions on it, but the government revenue grew 26% year over year. I think this is one of the reasons why people are actually trying to sell the stock right now or whatever. So Palantir was largely known as, as a government contractor type thing, even though they're not, they're, they just have like a really high clearance and, and their software is very highly valued in the government space and it's very highly recommended. So for them to only go 26% when it was either higher or it's showing signs that it's slowing down is a little bit tricky. Now, <laughs> one thing you guys don't know about the government side of it is that things generally move very, very, they move very slow. Okay. It's not, uh, it's not something that you can anticipate to be, you know, commercial level growth or any, any other kind of thing. Government is its own sort of thing. If you guys think like legacy auto or something is a big ship to turn, government is an absolute massive. It's like a, it's not even a ship it's like a wall that you have to turn it's very slow okay so on top of having this kind of slow moving you know molasses type you know people or, or organization let's call it right it is next to impossible for a comp one company to just go in and completely change that right on top of that because they don't move that fast they don't actually have that many verticals the verticals that they have and what i mean verticals i mean lines of businesses right they're either already there or the new ones aren't really, you know, they don't have the budgets that the old ones do because they've been there longer. There's more people, there's more budget that goes towards there because of familiarity and things like that. So, you know, there's only so many departments you can choose from. This isn't the commercial space, right? This is like one or a small subset of governments. So you guys have to let go of this, okay? Like for me, I'm not looking for this at all. Like every time I see this, it is what it is. The only time, only time I look for this is if, if commercial growth is very low and i compare that to government growth and it's also very low it's a super huge red flag okay so <laughs> so that's like basically the company's dying right but uh the government side to be honest i think i i call this out i call this out like in, in a video i don't know i can't remember what it was but i said that the government growth they're going to eventually sort of pull the plug on this and or either completely sort of make a separate department that handles this or just do something where they're like you know what let this thing just do its thing and then we're going to move towards the commercial side of it more they, they talked about this. this is exactly what they're planning to do Honestly, like if you look at most of the stuff, right? So cash, cash from operations, 93 million representing 22% margin. It's just whatever. Like a lot of the stuff in the, the whole highlights piece, it's just whatever. There's a lot of good things. Like they did beat revenue. They pretty much had beats across the board, except for the EPS, okay? It seems like their growth is starting to flatten out a little bit. And and I'm going to get into why this might be. And I did discuss this. We've been in the software game, guys. Like we've seen the stuff that uh, that needs to happen for this company. We recognize the software potential of this stuff. And, and that's really what I'm going to talk about here, okay? So well okay so let's let's talk about that real quick uh, i'll leave the link to the description as to where you can find the the earnings also i'll play a clip of sasha yanshin's video he actually really really delves deep into this stuff and, and he talks about how the growth is here and over there so if you're into the super hardcore financials go into there that really helped me as well uh just sort of like get my mind together on some of the other financial stuff that i was looking for okay now moving forward check this out I told you guys, I told you guys, the product maturity of Palantir, and, and Code Strap has mentioned this too, there it, it is just on another level, completely all together, it's on another level, okay? The problem with that, and this is the thing I've been beating from day one, and I, I, I can already tell this is exactly what some of you guys don't like, <laughs> you know, when I, when I talk about stuff, because I'm not just pumping every piece of news, right? I'm trying to be as realistic as possible. Um, so me being realistic i i told you like the company is so mature it's hard to sell it's not exactly the type of product that you walk into any organization and be like oh you know here's this yeah you know all the stuff that you're doing right now all of it's garbage why don't you just take what i'm talking about and and it's much better so take it right you can't just do that right it's gonna come off like you're just a dick and and it's, it's not it's not exactly gonna sit well with the management stuff because what you're doing effectively is you're coming and saying all you business people forget the tech all you business people that you made the, that made the decisions to have whatever product suite that you have right now, you guys are all stupid. Why didn't you go with us to begin with? Now we're here. We saved you. Nobody likes that, right? So it's just a bunch of posturing. Um, now they can back it up. Their product is solid. It really, really is. Like it, I, that's why I've made so many videos on it, right? But the problem has always been, and and in one of my first videos, I mentioned that they're selling it as actually quite, kind of cheap, right? In reality, they're actually quite expensive, but what I, why I meant cheap 
is because for the quality, for the actual scale of what this product does, it's going to take over your entire enterprise. Of course, you're going to pay just a little bit more than what you're already paying for everything. <laughs> you know what I mean? So in that way, it's pretty cheap. Okay. But when they see the sticker price, most people nowadays, you guys have to understand the business side of the IT space, right? Or the, 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 the people that actually make these decisions on these software, what they see is the sticker price. Okay. But then they also see the impact. Now you can't just be like, oh yes, it's more expensive, but we're going to change it and blow your mind. Like you can't, you can't do that. They're not going to believe you. They need to see breakdowns. And the problem with something like Palantir is that it's hard to break it down because it does pretty much everything. It's almost unbelievable. So for them, there's a better value of actually just going into Palantir completely and ditching the rest of your stuff or what they usually call grandfathering process, which is, you know, you, you, you have, you keep your lights on and then you basically buy Palantir. So there's a maybe, maybe like a bunch of months where you're really bleeding money, but that time you hire, or you just keep your uh, developers to transition away from your old method and go into Palantir, for example, right? Uh, a lot of stuff, like, especially when you're doing migrations and stuff, this is very common. It takes about six, seven months, depending on how big your data sets and how big your, uh, how many departments you have and stuff like that. But anyway, um, so that's the problem. It's, it's just so big. Now, Carp actually addressed this in the call, right? So he, he was talking about, oh, you know, we need to modularize. And again, we were right. I, I told you guys, like, the stuff we need to watch out for is how many salespeople they're hiring. They're hiring 200. That's what they're focused on. They want to hire about 200 salespeople too. And, and they're trying to also focus on the Europe side of it, which is huge because once you get in there, Europe is very sticky. It's like uh, the business side of Europe, you know, once you get into some of these companies, your product stays for a while, okay? Even, even more than the US. As I was mentioning before, it is important that they break this thing down and sell it to satisfy the current sort of business model because you can't just <laughs> you can't just shove this big thing down their throat it's not going to work the problem with Palantir guys has always been from day one and I've said this time and time and time and time and time again and some of you guys disputed it you know in the comments but I'm telling you <laughs> we're seeing proof of this stuff right we're, we're literally seeing what I'm talking about here which is fantastic product amazing business great model it is built for the future but we are not in the future yet. We are playing in the present. And in the present, we have people that manage money and manage businesses that don't understand the future. You see what I'm saying? There's a massive like disconnect here. Like the results from, from Q4 is going to be sort of just tepid, like for the most part. I'm not disappointed. I think there are good numbers, to be honest with you. But they're not like hyper growth numbers, right? Uh, there's a lot of good things. But they pretty much got beats. Um, there's some losses. Oh, by the way, stock-based compensation. And this is another thing that I mentioned. God, like... I know this is going to start like a whole different battle in the comment section or whatever, but the stock, base, the stock based compensation guys, like the dilution actually isn't that bad, but the, here's, there's some bad news here for those of you who really don't care about stock based compensation. Okay. They're not done. <laughs> okay. It seems like they're going to continue onboarding these new staff members and, uh, and, and continue this sort of like this type of hiring process. And, and again, I mentioned this for me, the concern was that I hope they got to a point where it's almost like regular tech companies. So if that is a concern for you, and it was for me until I started to realize like the type of people that they're trying to hire and the direction that they're going now, it is still a concern in a way. Now they're saying they're going to do this for another 18 months. We'll see what happens in that 18 months, whether, you know, there's going to be more dilution or, you know, depends on how, how they're doing the stock based compensation, of course. Right. But so far I'm okay with it. I, I see what's happening. I'm actually not too worried about it. It makes sense. They need to hire the best talent they can um, and sort of move forward from there. Now let's move on to the next topic, which is, the modularization of foundry right and, and this is the stuff we talked about before too again something that we mentioned code strap as well mentioned it so go check out his video on foundry and, and the developer community but they are piecing together it seems like they're putting together something where they're going to start building a little more horizontally they're trying to they're trying to sign as many deals as possible now the problem, and we alluded to this in this previous point, which is a lot of folks right now can only understand the existing part, which is you buy compute, you pay for storage, you pay for each individual piece, it's almost like a pay-as-you-go type of thing. You piece it all together, and that's your system, okay? Palantir obviously does pretty much the whole gamut. I don't, Not all of it, it doesn't do all of it, but it does most of it. So it could probably take over 60, 70% of that space in your IT infrastructure or IT process-oriented infrastructure, right? So do you need to split up foundry there's absolutely no way now the real value is actually selling the foundry selling foundry as a whole a whole like platform right but if they split up foundry they'll actually be able to get into the ears of these uh, uh money managers inside the companies or project managers or whoever it is that makes these decisions directors vps okay on top of that they're hiring 200 salespeople, like we mentioned before right you got to give these people something to sell. Now, good salespeople are extremely hard to hire. Just almost as much, almost as hard as hiring good engineers, okay? But 
when you hire them, unfortunately or fortunately, you still have to give them something to sell. You can't just be like, you know what, here's a piece of sand, go sell it, right? You have to give them something to sell. They're, what you're doing actually by hiring these salespeople is you're hiring their connections. You're not actually hiring their skill set. You're hiring their connections. And most of the good ones will have very, very broad connections across industries, across different companies. So when they on, get onboarded, you can't just be like, here you go, man, sell this massive juggernaut as a product and just shove it down all of your people's like, you know, all of your connections, right? Because they'll quit go straight up. Like the straight salespeople, they'll be like, this is stupid. Like I've worked for years building these connections. I've worked for like decades in some cases, right? And I'm not going to push this whole thing, which people don't even understand. So for you have to split it up. You have to modularize and make it actually a little more piecemeal so that when you talk to the VPs, when you talk to the directors, you, when the salespeople take them out for lunches and stuff, you're able to explain to them in, in terms that they understand. Right. And this this takes me to the last point here. So let me show you what uh, uh, Sasha was talking about. Now, I'll chime in here a little bit as well, but check this out. Now, one thing I really did not like in the presentation and in the Q&A was the amount of arrogance coming from Alex Carp. A bit of arrogance is great. Uh, you know, every CEO has it. But I really and I really appreciate that he's built a really phenomenal company that is doing seriously amazing stuff. But there were continuous references to how Palantir is completely leagues and streets ahead of any other company. Every other company is pretty much mm. irrelevant. How no other company is really building any new software. Palantir is the only one. He literally right. said that. And generally, there was far <laughs> too much self-congratulating and patting himself on the back. I am sure that Palantir is doing great things. But saying that absolutely nobody else knows what they're doing, everyone else sucks, and you are the only <laughs> smart guy in the room, is not the best indicator of Palantir appreciating risks to their business and the long road ahead for the company, especially when the company's growth has been slowing down. <laughs> As a shareholder, yeah. I think it's likely to be a somewhat rocky few quarters while Palantir upgrades the sales process and before that new sales process shows up in the revenue numbers. But the indicators are there that perhaps they are working on turning the tide. All right, so just on that part, I'm gonna tell you straight up, that is, I, I agree with him a little bit, right? Now, I like Alex Carp, totally awesome, like I get it and all that, right? What he's saying is not wrong. I 100% agree with him. But the problem is his delivery. His delivery is more like, so all of you guys, all of you guys, get the out of here. You know, like you guys are nothing but shit. Like we, we make, we're going to be the future. Like he's right now, like the little guy in the room. When he looks around him, he just sees a bunch of bodybuilders. The boy's about to get clapped, man. It's like he, he's got good stuff. Like he's got the frame. He's got good stuff, you know, but he's got to put in the work. And... I make this argument a lot too, and, and there's no shade on Alex Karp. Like I, I really think he is the CEO to lead this company forward. Him and Peter Thiel, I think, will completely change how these things will work. Okay, so don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to hate on the guy, but what I'm saying is, you know, again, he's playing in a space with a lot, a lot of really smart people. This is not just <laughs> like there's a reason why Google, Microsoft are at the top of their game at any given moment. Like only now Facebook is starting to get taken down just a little bit, right? And there's a mass exodus, but. You know, to be honest with you, big tech is, they're not done. This is, they're in, they're in their prime, guys. Like, I don't think people understand the level of talent that sits in, like, fan companies. You guys do not get it. Like, Palantir, there's a reason why they have to give so much stock-based compensation. They could very well pay people a lot of money, but they have to entice them with stock, right? They have to entice them with some options. There's a reason for that. People, there's some good talent everywhere. Databricks is another good company. I mean, like, Coastrap did a good video on it. Go check it out. But you got to believe that there's tons of good talent out there and you know big tech isn't as as disparate as uh as like legacy auto and tesla for example very very large competition and, the, and i keep saying this but the one reason i do think that you know these guys are going to face that kind of competition is basically because i think the fan companies are all the competitors right now the reason why uh Shrub thinks they're all garbage and stuff is mainly because they kind of don't have to be any better the business people will still buy their product this is what it is, right? So now when Palantir is on the scene, these guys will take a look. I, in my opinion, I don't know. I, I'm thinking these guys will take a look and say, okay, well, what do you have and how much are you selling, right? Once they split up Foundry, I think the sales will go up. They're hiring tons of salespeople. We're only going to see these things move forward. Um, 2022, I think, is going to be a fabulous year if you're a Palantir investor just because it's, the stock price is going to be so low pretty much the whole year and you're going to have a really good buying opportunity, in my opinion. I'm definitely going to be looking forward to that in the next few months, especially when some of the macro things boil down into whatever we're going to we're going to see in the next, you know, probably six months, I'd say. 
Um, so for me, I'm looking to add more shares. I'm still super bullish on the company, but the thing is I want to see, for example, like all the things I want to see is here. They're hiring sales. They're onboarding the sales ramp. Uh, the stock, stock based competition is high, but it is what it is, right? You have to hire talent. I get that. Their revenue is growing. Um, they're growing the commercial sector as well. It's not like it's not growing, right? That's exactly where they want to be. Is it hyper growth? No, but is it pretty much it, like, am I disappointed in any way? Definitely not. Like, definitely not. Um, Again, for me, like I'm trying to look at things in an objective light. This is our money that we're putting into this. I don't want to just hype up every single piece of news. But again, just to shade this in, in, in the right way that I want to get the message across. Totally not disappointed with this earnings. I'm actually, <laughs> I actually like the earnings, to be honest with you. I'm just presenting a case where you can see it both ways. There are some things that you can pick out of it and be like, this is exactly where we need to start focusing on. And Palantir is already doing that. That's the thing. They're already doing that. Um, they are realizing, in my opinion, that they're basically trying to catch falling knives with this massive product that they're trying to push to their clients. So I really think that they do, their leadership is smart enough where they're able to pivot and move fast, kind of like a startup, right? Even though they're like a 20 year old company, so to speak, right? Uh, Foundry is only a six year old, kind of seven year old product. So there's lots of potential there for them once they chalk it up. Uh, by the way, when they chalk it up, it's, I think it's going to run something like a catalog model. Um, or managed services type model. I'll go into the specs of that and how that's going to work in another video. But that's it for me. I, to be honest, again, I'm not too crazy about it. There's a lot of retail investors in this stock, so I know it's going to go up and down like crazy. I'm going to sit on a pile of cash and uh, let's see the macro environment push out a little bit. And I'll probably buy in bulk, might be in three, four months. That's pretty much my plan. It is what it is. But again, let me know what you think in the comment section below. I will catch you all in the next one. Peace. Perfect.